10 to 12, uh, just to give kind of a outline of where we're going, and then we'll read the whole of chapter 26. It's a big chunk of work, um, but it's important. We need to cover this. Uh, these are a single part of Luke's great narrative, and that's what we're doing in the evening service. We're taking a thematic view of the book of Acts. We're looking at it. We're taking it seriously. And what we're going to encounter today is a weird thing that we often don't like to admit, or if we do like to admit, we like to admit in the wrong way. And I'll explain this as we go. This is the idea that Christianity puts you outside of the norm of human society. I'll put it in more simple language. If you really start to take the Bible seriously, you start to get labeled a little bit as crazy. It just kind of happens. The Bible is filled with some really, really weird stuff. And either we take it seriously or we don't. And the problem is none of us actually like to be that side of crazy. Uh, one of my favorite things in the academic world, as soon as someone gets to a certain level in academic, they try and uh, excuse the crazy Bible. So we're going to go through Ezekiel in a morning service, and you'll see this throughout the studies. Is the guys are like, no, uh, Ezekiel was having a trance. Ezekiel was probably on some some kind of medicated uh, hallucinogen. They'll say anything except for the fact that God literally showed Himself up to the, to speak to 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 Ezekiel. Why? Because that's that just that side of crazy. It's weird. God doesn't speak to people like you mad. Except the Bible is pretty full of God speaking to people, right? And, and do me yourself a favor. Go to work tomorrow in like a business meeting and start off by saying, you know what, God spoke to me last night. <laughs> and see how that goes. Now, I'm going to put it on the side. This is my warning. There are a lot of people who are actually ostensibly crazy who do say that all the time. And we don't want to get into that line. So we want to walk that, that, razor, that razor line of believing the Bible but not falling off the deep end, right? Well, that's what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to read this. Just to give some context, we'll be reading from verse 25, uh, 10 to 12. And just to cover the context here... I'll tell you the short version of Luke's story. I, I really encourage you to read through these two chapters. They're fantastic. They really are great. But Paul finally, I mean, we've, he's been delayed and frustrated and delayed and frustrated. He finally gets his trial. He, he gets to stand under Festus, the guy who replaced Felix, who held him under confinement for two years. He finally gets to state his case. And he makes the claim that there is no law and there is no reality of why he should be held under this entrapment, under this imprisonment. In fact, he even goes as far to say, there is no, there's not even a Jewish law that I'm violating. The guys who are trying to accuse me are wrong. He says this in verse 25, uh, chapter 25, verse 10 to 12. Hear the word of God. Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as yourself know very well. If, any, if, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with the council, he declares, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. Now, Let's just consider why Paul is so desperate to get to Caesar. This becomes very important, especially as we finish off the book of Acts, this letter. Saul is not trying to push his Roman citizenship. This is not Paul saying, you know what, Christians, fight for your rights. This is not the lesson that Luke wants to get us. Paul wants to get to Rome for one reason. We've told this, I've told you this a number of times. You need to get this. Paul wants to get to Rome because at Rome he can take his ship to Tarshish and when he gets to Tarshish, he has reached the end of the table of nations. He has finished the mandate. Paul fundamentally believed that when he got to Tarshish, Jesus would come. The Messiah would come. He's finished his task. 
So he's motivated. He's motivated. He doesn't mind if he dies going there. He is going to finish this mission. So with that in mind, let's read chapter 26. And before we read, I just want to give you a little bit more context. Paul finally gets his chance to defend himself. He gets an audience with Agrippa, the king. And so let's read. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand to begin his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are so well, so well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people know all, uh, all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long t- time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise of our twelve tribes who are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. And the authority of the chief priests I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And, when they, were th- uh, were, and, and th- when they were there, I put them to death. I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to the other to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. And about noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard the voice say to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you persecute the Lord, the Lord replied, Now get up and stand at your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as the servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue from your own people and from the, and from the Gale- uh, Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea, then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. This is why some of the Jews seized me in the temple of the court and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer at first as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of life to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. Are you out of your mind, Paul? He shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. I am saying what is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who listen to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them, 
And after they left the room, they began saying to one another, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I told you it was a great passage of scripture. It's a really, it reads well, it communicates well. Uh, we need to get used to hearing the word of God like that. I thought it was awesome. Anyway, to tackle this, to tackle what the main theme or what Luke's trying to tell us tonight is to realize a deep and abiding truth of the Christian faith. Is that it's not Ill- illogical. In fact, it has taken some of the greatest minds that have ever seen the, the face of this earth to unpack it. And I really mean that. If you go back through church history, you will see some of the greatest minds ever to have ever existed wrestling with the truth of the Christian gospel and the Christian faith. These are geniuses. It's not illogical and it's not untrue. Its problem is it goes against the goads of regular thinking. It sounds a little crazy to those who are not inside the community of faith. In fact, often when it's critiqued from the outside, the world looks at us and says, we're weird. I can't tell you how many times in my ministry, one of my youth people or someone is like, you guys sound a little bit like a cult. I'm like, well, the way did kind of start like a cult, if you kind of think about it, it was a sect. But it does sound weird. And the whole reason it sounds weird is because the text that we hold to is weird. I don't know if you've realized this. We read and believe in a strange Bible. And this is our first point, the strangeness of the Bible. For this, I'm going to lean on the work of Mark Knowles heavily because I think he, more than anyone else, has done a great um, exposition of what happens when the church tries to appeal to human reason and the human mind or the human thinking of their day. And I'll get to what I mean by that. The reality is, church, none of us like to live outside of normal. I don't know if you've realized that. Who likes to be the crazy person in the room? You know? Who likes to stick out like a sore thumb because what you are saying is weird? There's been many a times, because I'm just this kind of person, where we'll start a question or someone will start a question at dinner and I'm like, whoa, wait, wait, this is rubbish. Let's talk about this. And we start talking. And you can see the rest of the table become increasingly uncomfortable as we chat back and forth. And I'm like, I don't mind being uncomfortable. And everyone's like, I'm so sorry. We don't normally say this. I'm like, this is great. This is real stuff. Stop. Shh. Go away. Have your conversations about rubbish. Let's talk about the faith, you know. But who actually likes being that? There's been many a times. I remember sitting on a plane once. And the person sits down next to me and they're like, so, you know, that, that terrible question. So what do you do? And I'll just give you a side note. One of the terrible things about being a pastor is everyone always asks what you do and so you have to be ready to give a defense of your faith. Like, the rest of you can get away with it, you know. I'm not jealous. I'm just saying. You know, how do you slip in? I'm a finance guy. Let's talk about Jesus, you know. So I sit down. I'm tired. I haven't slept in 30 hours. So, what do you do? I'm a theologian. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's interesting. No, I'm a pastor. Oh, oh, okay. Weirdo. You know, straight up. We don't like being weird. In fact, it's, it's easy to conform ourselves to the patterns and thoughts of this world and live according to it, isn't it? It's easy to follow the middle road. But this is mine, I lean on Knowles. And I have to admit, I read this And it was one of the most uncomfortable reads I've ever read in my entire life. I've recommended to everyone. My problem is I was reading at the exact same time as I was reading George Marsden's book, Fundamentalism and and American Culture. And these two books together, read at the same time, ripped me apart. Because I just need to warn you, I am an evangelical. I believe in the evangelical church. I I believe in the people who hold to the evangelion, to the, the gospel. This is my home. This is my cultural stream that I swim in. I I was brought up under Dr. Rex Matthew, who was known as the Prince of Preachers in the Baptist Union. Evangelical of evangelical. So I'm reading this, and I'm an evangelical of evangelical, and Mark Knowles and George Martin just make obvious, obvious statements 
that we are not all we claim to be. Our emphasis on the gospel and reading the Bible just literally is simply not true. Unfortunately, evangelicals read the Bible philosophically first. And I just need to warn you this. They read it through the lens of modernism. Modernism, very simple, is the philosophy developed in the Victorian era that human reason is the pinnacle of all things. And guess what? We still read it today like this. We read the Bible as moderns, not as ancients. And this becomes our problem. And see, this is what happens. What happens when the church puts the philosophy over the biblical worldview, we find ourselves in an indefensible position because we end up defending our philosophy rather than the Bible. And we sadly do this far more often than we are willing to admit. Do you know that, church? We really do. I know this is going to be hard. I've had to journey through this. It's hard, but we do this. And, 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 church, we are Baptists, right? You're in a Baptist church. We, if the Bible says it, we believe it, that settles it, right? Except the Bible speaks about angels coming down and interbreeding with human beings. And we're like, yeah, but, right? Right? Like, we believe the Bible, but that's kooky. So it's not, the, not angels, it's the sons of Seth married the daughters of Cain, because at least that's human and humans. We totally, totally read into that text, and we do this so often, church. We do this so often. In fact, we read the Bible in a way that has not been around since the 17th century. We strip it quite often of its supernatural worldview. We strip it of its philosophies. We strip it of its weirdness. And the stuff that they were reading and impacts the texts. I'm just saying that. We do. We do. And, and I say this in love. This is a difficult, difficult thing to reconcile. Now, I'm not saying you can't read the Bible as it just as it is. But do you never notice that the Bible invites you to say, wait, wait, this doesn't make sense. Like, this doesn't make sense to me. Step out of yourself into my worldview. That's what the Bible is constantly saying. Just, just step a little bit deeper in. And this is the point in all this, why I've brought this up, church, is we have a weird and wonderful worldview presented to us in the Bible. It's weird. And this is what Paul is on trial for. You know what no one was expecting in the first century? Someone to come back from the dead and live forever. That just wasn't there. In fact, it so wasn't there. It's why I chose the Mark passage in the beginning of this passage. Jesus clearly told them, sorry, at the beginning of this, um, this, uh, this service. Jesus clearly tells his disciples. He's like, he doesn't mince words. Disciples, you've lived with me for three years. The Messiah must die and in three days be raised again. And the disciples are like, don't get it, too embarrassed to ask. Jesus is just on one of his weird, you know, no one understands what he's talking about when he gets like this. In other words, the guys who lived with Jesus, when invited into the strangers of the Bible, what did they say? I don't get it. So I'm just going to, be keep, I'm just going to keep quiet and carry on. Do you see how it's pulling us in? And can I just encourage you, church? I guarantee if you've read the Bible at least once through, you start to get this tug of saying, go deeper. By the time you've gone through it like four or five times, it is screaming at you saying, you don't, you don't have it all together. Come into my world and be pulled apart a little bit. And doesn't that happen to us? That's why I love the Bible presents to us some strange things. You know what the weirdest of all those, the strangest of all the things of the Bible is the idea that God decided to become a human. That is weird. And in fact, you know, on the side note, thank you church for taking Christmas seriously. Like that's what I love about this church. Like we're big on Christmas. We're doing a huge Christmas thing this year. Awesome. We need to because that is the weirdest event that's ever happened in human history. 
And we need to think about that, because we don't. Go into the weirdness of the Bible. And if you do this, church, you know what's going to happen to you? This is my warning for you tonight. If you take the Bible seriously, if you read the Bible on its own terms, the world's going to look at you and say, you're out of your minds. You're out of your minds. Our second point. And I love the interaction between Paul and Festus in this. I mean, you're just like, in the middle of his defense, Paul, stop reading so much. You're going mad. I love that. Like, <laughs> I can actually totally understand that. There's been many times in my PhD course where I was like, I am actually losing my mind. But, uh, so I, can, I totally understand that statement. But you're losing it, Paul. You're going mad. And do you think that you're going to try and convert me in such a short time that this crazy person Paul's like, wait, wait, short time, long time. I'm going to convert as many people as I can. I'm going to pull you in to the crazy world that I've been in because it's true. I'm not out of my mind. This is reasonable and true. And church, I want to just say this. The more you take the Bible true, the more you take it seriously, you'll see how reasonable and true it is. On a side note, this is totally for free, but I was in a class on on Monday with uh, my students and we are dealing with angels and demons and I don't tow the party line with angels and demons. I, I show them the gamut of interpretations. At the end of the class, people are like, Barry, I'm done. I'm up here. And it's like, it's too much information. And I just asked the question, I'm like, does this make sense? And one of the guys said, and it was brilliant, he says, this has made more sense than anything else I've heard before on this topic. In other words, it was reasonable and true, just no one has exposed people to it, because you know what? It sounds a little crazy. It sounds weird. When you start speaking about princes of Persia, and the princes of Israel, and these being angelic beings, and you start, start speaking about these kind of things, people say, you're crazy. And church, this presents a real challenge to us. Are you willing to be seen as crazy? Are you willing to be seen as strange by the world for the wonder of the biblical worldview and the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because that's where it's inviting you. Either we accept our current worldview, you live in your stream, or you let the Bible pull you into it. And I'm just going to say... Church, those two things are simply not compatible. You can't be a regular, everyday, 21st century person and take the Bible seriously. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> not seriously, but like, you're, you're going to be at odds with one of those two things. In fact, this is why I think James would say, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This is not talking about the material world. This is talking about the philosophical systems of the world. You're comfortable with this world and how it's going and how things make sense? James would say you're an enemy of God. Because you're bringing everything down to the physical. You're trying to make sense of it. If your longings are for the systems and how things make sense, if, if you really are fighting for left or right wing political ideology as more important than the Bible, you're not comfortable with the weirdness of the Bible. And so church, I call you again to dive in. To be like Paul. See the wonder of Jesus and the miracle of that and realize that the world and everything that you've seen doesn't make sense in light of that. Take Jesus by the hand and let him take you as far into his word as he wants to. Don't stop when it doesn't make sense. Press on. Press further. Now, one more warning. This doesn't mean that you need to go out there and be purposefully weird. I have to say this because I know, like as I was finishing off the sermon, I'm like, wait, wait. I am not giving you the allowance to be a weirdo. 
just because you're kooky and you like to like, I don't know, jump for no reason or like shout out for no reason. That's not what the Bible is calling you into. I'm saying, so the Bible's not saying be weird. The Bible is weird. So go into that. Not into your own weirdness, not into sinfulness, into the Bible. Are you getting it? You see the journey? I've been diving into this for nearly 20 years. Just reading and rereading and rereading and rereading. And I honestly don't think an eternity is long enough for us to get to the depth and wonder of these 66 books. So I encourage you, open those pages. Read the weirdness. Don't explain it away. Dive in. Be willing to be out of your mind. Let's pray. Lord, it, it, still, it still shakes me to my core. The great lengths you went to that we might have these 66 books that you've laid claim to being your word. And Lord, if you want us to hear us, hear it as it is. I pray that we would open our minds to what you are saying. Not what you are saying to 21st century us, but what you are saying in the context, because that is what you said. It's our journey, our, our privilege to go and cover those. So I pray for our church, Lord. Holy Spirit, we so desperately need your guidance. Man, we need your guidance. Lord, we so desperately need each other in this church to hold us together in the weirdness of the Scripture. Well, thank you that you've given us both. Thank you that you've given us abundance of information and scholars and wise people within this church, even this church, to guide us on this weird and wonderful journey to the God who speaks to sinners like us. Lord, I pray for everyone here. Pray that we'll be hearers. Hearers and doers of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand as we sing our closing song?